Hello and welcome back to London Cycle Routes. Today I'll be showing you how to cycle from Stratford in East London to Tottenham in North London. This ride takes about 35 minutes and you can do the whole thing on quiet streets and protected cycle lanes. By public transport the same journey takes around 45 minutes so you can definitely save time by getting on your bike. If you find this video useful or you just enjoy watching it then don't forget to hit the subscribe button as I try to post new videos just like it every week. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to contribute as well you can find a link in the description below the video. Alright let's get going. So we're starting on Celebration Avenue just next to Stratford International Railway Station and we're going to go along the side of the new Victory Park. I've chosen to go along the path along the eastern side of the park but there's actually a wider path on the western edge of the park so you might want to go that way instead. They both end up in more or less the same place. For us that leads to a cul-de-sac called Napa Close and if you were on the western edge it would lead to a cul-de-sac called Logan Close which looks more or less identical. Both of them lead onto Onnelly Avenue just here which has a two-way protected cycle track along the far side which we've now joined. I think it's great to see cycle lanes of a reasonable quality like this going in in the new developments around here although as you can see some people might just be comfortable cycling on the road as there isn't really much traffic. After a short section of shared space just there at the junction we go on to another protected lane down Temple Mills Lane. This is a decent wide track although it gives up at side roads like the one here and also as you can see at the bus stops. Given the low level of both pedestrian and car traffic around here this isn't the end of the world although it would be great to see it fixed. I think the plan is that this area won't stay dead like this forever as people move into the new developments around the Olympic Park. If that happens and it does get more busy then those things will start to become problems in a way that they're maybe not right now. If you're not too familiar with this road by the way it is worth noting that we did just do a little detour away from the main carriageway as the cycle path separates from the main carriageway as we pass under that motorway bridge. It's not a big deal but it's definitely worth mentioning from a wayfinding point of view as when the path veers away you may think uh, where's this going I really just want to go straight down the road. Well you just continue following the path and you'll get back on the road soon enough. I really like the design of this junction here joining Rockholt Road although unfortunately there was a van stopped on the crossing for us this time. Just coming up there's another junction with something that you need to be aware of the lights coming up in a second are actually triggered by a push button and there's a blue sign on it saying use push button. It's really important that you do press this button as you won't get a light phase if you don't press it. It's not the best design in this case as the lights are actually slightly forward of where the button is so if you cycle forward and stop at the lights as most people tend to do then you won't actually be able to reach the push button unless you go back a little bit. But yeah, basically don't forget to press it, otherwise you'll be waiting there for a very long time. The cycle lane along this road, Orient Way, is a two-way track. It's relatively narrow for people travelling in two directions to be honest, but at this level of traffic it's relatively fine. One feature about it that actually kind of annoys me is that a couple of years ago some contractors did some utility work here and dug a big trench in the middle of the cycle lane. They then fill the trench up with, yeah, red tarmac, but unfortunately it's not perfectly level with the rest of the track. This has actually basically damaged the track to an extent, especially if you're riding on a road bike. It's not really fun to be riding along the seam of the track. And given the path is already a little bit narrower than we'd like it to be, it does kind of reduce the usable width a little bit. I honestly think that when utility companies do works like this they should really be made to leave the surface in exactly the same condition that they found it. They are after all for profit companies and they shouldn't be cutting corners and damaging the public realm to make things cheaper for themselves. By the way look on your left and you'll see some train carriages just there behind those bushes. That's because we're passing the Temple Mills depot 
which is where the trains for both Greater Anglia and Eurostar are looked after. One thing you do need to be aware of on this track on Orient Way is coming up on your right here. It's the entrance to this industrial estate and the track does not have priority over that side road. Do just be aware then that there could be sort of heavy goods vehicles and vans going in and out of that industrial estate as there could be here as well. Coming up at the north end of Orient Way, we come to a big junction with Lee Bridge Road, which also has great cycle tracks running down it. This junction is a great example of how to do a junction. You can see here that we've got a green light and we're going to cross the road and we'll also have a green light to go left in the same phase. That's called a simultaneous green and it applies to both pedestrians and cycles at the same time and it means that we don't have to wait to cross two arms of the junction. This is really probably the ideal junction design when it comes to cycling and it particularly makes sense when you have two roads with protected cycle lanes meeting each other at a junction. Not only is it convenient in that you don't have to wait twice, but it also prevents you from having to mix with motor traffic. You're kept separate from cars both physically with a curb and also in time by the signals. Unfortunately, this type of junction is currently quite rare in London and I can only think of a handful of examples of it, all of which are in the borough of Waltham Forest which we're currently in now. It's actually a lot more common in other cities in the UK, particularly Manchester and Salford. My understanding is that it's relatively rare in London because it's quite capacity intensive in the sense that requiring a separate phase for cycles and pedestrians eats into the time that motor traffic is able to pass through junctions. And while London is often quite forward thinking when it comes to cycle infrastructure, TfL is also very concerned by bus reliability in a way that highway authorities in other cities aren't. And if TfL's modelling shows that a particular junction design will eat into the amount of time available to general traffic and affect bus reliability, then TfL tends to say no to that design. I think it's important to say though that modelling is not flawless and it doesn't take into account modal shift, so it doesn't take into account junctions getting less busy because people have switched from cars to cycling because it's now really easy to cycle. So I think they're really missing a trick there to be honest. Now the route that we've been following so far has mostly been on protected cycle lanes but you might notice that we're now on a main carriageway without a cycle lane. But it's dead quiet and the reason for that is just up ahead. These signs you can see say no motor vehicles except local buses and cycles and there's a bus coming just through there. This is actually a bus gate and it's a really good example of a, uh, a traffic measure that benefits both people on buses and also on bikes because by removing motor traffic you remove congestion which allows the bus service to run freely, quickly and without hindrance and it also allows people of all abilities to cycle through the area without worrying about cars. That bus gate is part of the Copper Mill low traffic neighbourhood which has been in for a couple of years now and as you can see it's not just about traffic calming, it's also about beautifying the space and having sort of nice gardens and planting around the area. There are local people there working on their local plants. For the next few minutes we're going to work our way up through the Copper Mill low traffic neighbourhood on these quiet streets and you'll see that there's very little in the way of traffic because all the through traffic has been removed by strategically placed road closures, bus gates, bollards, other things like that and it means that people around here can really go where they need to go without having to worry about whether or not the road will be safe. This section of the route is a little bit on the wiggly side so if you think you might get lost or you can't remember the twists and turns you can always download the free map in the description of the video. There's a link there, it's to a website called Komoot and you can download the GPS, GPX file there and you can use it on whatever app or device you choose to use. It's a standard format. While you're looking down there make sure you also hit the like button if you're enjoying the video as it does help other people find it. And if you're not already subscribed, make sure you hit subscribe. It's free, it just alerts you when there are new videos. 
You can also check out the map of London cycle routes videos down there. It was put together by viewers. It was originally done by John and updated by Isaac. Thanks very much to you guys and to everybody else who also offered to update it and put the map together. It's a really great resource and just a useful directory for looking at the different videos I've done. Now we're back on the main road here and there's a very brief section here where there's no protected cycle lane. It's just here. It's not usually an issue if there's no queuing traffic, which there was when I came here, but then we're immediately back on the protected lanes. I think Waltham Forest does a really good job of building a network of protected cycle lanes and there's also another great simultaneous green junction here and beautifully if we want to turn left we don't have to wait for the lights as the cycle lane stays inside the corner of the junction. I hope you spotted the very cute dog there sitting in the cycle lane. I had absolutely no issue going around him. It was a treat to see him. We get similarly excellent protected cycle lanes on Forest Road here, although for some reason that I'm actually not sure of, on the other side of the road, the lane is not quite finished, just approaching that junction we went through. I'm not quite clear why that is. It's possibly something to do with utility works, but the rest of the lane is complete, including on the other side down here. I also like what they've done with the rain gardens and the planting on this road. It used to be really quite dull and very asphalty, and they made it a lot nicer, although it does, as you can see from that woman walking in the cycle lane, slightly restrict the width of both the lane and the pavement, which is not ideal, but I think it looks pretty nice, and it should also help prevent flooding when there's heavy rain, as this is quite a marshy area generally. I'm really pleased that that sort of planting, which is both decorative and practical, is becoming so much more popular in London and you can see here on the right a great example of it in bloom in early summer. It just looks really nice, it really brings the place to life. We're actually leaving the London Borough of Waltham Forest in a moment and heading into the London Borough of Haringey, which is right next to it. And the, uh, the type of cyclone that we're on will change a little bit. It'll stop being segregated by a curb, but it is still a protected lane. It's just protected by these metal wands, which are quite characteristic of how Haringey builds lanes. This section is quite good, although I wish that they would put a bus stop bypass in here, as if there was a bus stopped at that stop, it would actually be quite a pain to get around it, particularly with heavy traffic like this. But as you can see, we are still protected from the traffic. Unfortunately, it goes downhill quite rapidly when we get past this junction here at the start of Tottenham Hale Station. Um, there's a little drop curb here which indicates to us to go onto the shared pavement and there is an ice cream van parked on the pavement and then the shared pavement has to give way at this entrance to a retail park and I've left this in just so you can see the drawback of this design. It's really not super positive. Even though they've painted a little cycle track on this section of the pavement, the fact that we don't have priority over those side roads really puts us at a disadvantage and will encourage a lot of people to stay on the road. There's then this three-stage crossing to get over Broad Lane with quite a narrow pedestrian island. These are toucan crossings. You can see the little cycle symbol on the lights there. Indicates that you're allowed to be there, but... Although you're allowed to be there, it doesn't really feel like it was designed for you if you're on a bike. So it would be lovely to see that whole junction area reworked so that it was a little bit more like those ones in Waltham Forest that we went through with the simultaneous green junctions and the proper protected lanes. I know that Haringey does have some ambitions to build some sort of cycle route through that area heading west, actually in the direction that we're going. So I'll be keeping an eye on any designs that they publish and I'll let you guys know if there are any plans to do things a little bit better than they're currently being done. Make sure you stay vigilant as you go around this corner by the way as the carriageway is quite narrow and it's a bit of a blind corner due to the construction hoarding. You then come out onto Chestnut Road which quickly turns into this really lovely pedestrianised spot. I wish that more streets were like this, I think it's a really nice way of doing things with the planting on the side, no parking and it is pedestrian as well. Unfortunately this sort of bliss doesn't last too long as we have to turn right through a car park and while there is not going to be any fast moving traffic through here, do keep an eye and be careful as you go through as of course any of these cars could move at any time and they might not check to see whether you're there or not. 
If you look at the sign on that house on the right, you'll see it's called Kane Court, spelt with a K. I do wonder whether that's named after Harry Kane, the Tottenham player. We are basically in Tottenham after all, although I couldn't find any information about the building's name online. Now, in an ideal road, that road we crossed there, Tottenham High Road, we would have just been able to go straight up it on protected cycle lanes, but unfortunately it's really busy and there's no cycling facilities on it at all. But what we can do is route through some of Haringey's new low traffic neighbourhoods, which we're just entering now. That filter we just went through is part of the Bruce Grove West Green low traffic neighbourhood and it and all the other road closures around here are keeping the streets really, really quiet. St. Lloyd's Road that we're on right now is a little bit of a hill and it's much more pleasant to cycle up without a car riding up behind you. Be cautious as you cycle through this alleyway by the way, although it's shared space which means you're allowed to cycle there, you could expect to see some pedestrians and it's not super wide so you don't want to give anybody a shock. We're actually following the route of Cycle Super Highway 1 here which is a route that's been in place for a number of years. We're not sticking to it religiously though and we're going to leave it in a second. One thing of note though is this street that we're on right now, Broadwater Road, has had a fantastic resurfacing job from just around here. The tarmac's really, really smooth compared to the last time I came up here and it really does make a big difference. It's a lot more pleasant to cycle down here than it was before. It's dead straight and it runs almost exactly parallel to the high road, so it's really not an issue. You're not going too much further going on this road compared to if you were on the main road, once you're on here at least. Pay close attention here if you want to learn how to use the crossing over Lordship Lane. It's an informal crossing with a protective island which allows you to take it in two stages. If you look on your left here, you'll also see these doctors only parking bays and the fact that one of the doctors is actually moonlighting as a builder. This road is relatively quiet and coming up on our left in a second, you'll see All Hallows Church, Tottenham, which was supposedly a gift to the area in around 1200 from King David I of Scotland, who owned nearby Bruce Castle, which is named after the Scottish Bruce family. That also gives its name to the area, Bruce Grove, and to the low traffic neighbourhood, Bruce Grove West Green low traffic neighbourhood, which is more important for our purposes. The Bruce family actually owned around a third of Tottenham, and they kept it until 1306 when Robert the Bruce, the most famous, became Robert I of Scotland and forfeited his lands in England. The name lives on, however, including on the tube map. Just a reminder that if you're enjoying this video, make sure you hit the like button as it does help other people find it on YouTube. And if you like what we're doing here, hit subscribe, which is free and will just alert you when there are new videos posted on the channel. If you really like the channel and you're a regular viewer, you could always consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you so much to those of you who already do so. For those of you who don't, there's a link in the description below the video. Now, as we round this corner, you'll see Tottenham Hotspur Stadium looming up over us, which means we've come to our final destination. It's been one of the longer videos, but I'd say it's probably one of the better ones as well. It uses a really big combination of protected lanes when you're going through the first bit. There's low traffic neighbourhoods and there's some legacy routes as well. And I think it all stitches together pretty well. Please do let me know in the comments what you think of that journey. I really enjoyed making it. And I should be back again next week with another video. So stay safe in the meantime, happy cycling, and I'll see you again next time.